We're now going to move on to the final part of the evening's program, a conversation about grassroots activism and philanthropy led by Gary LaMarche and featuring representatives of our three Frederick Douglass awardee organizations. I'd like to invite them now up to the Oprah couch. Come on up to the Oprah couch. That's as close to Oprah as we're getting tonight. I have the chair. Anna Maria. Gary LaMarche is president and CEO of the Atlantic Philanthropies, which is dedicated to bringing about lasting changes in the lives of disadvantaged and vulnerable people. Before joining Atlantic, he served as vice president and director of US programs for the Open Society Institute, associate director of Human Rights Watch, director of the Freedom to Write program at the Penn American Center, and in a variety of positions at the ACLU. He's the author of numerous articles on human rights and social justice and teaches a course in philanthropy and public policy at New York University's Wagner School of Public Service. He serves on the boards of Penn American Center, the White House Project, and is a member of the advisory committee of the Sundance Documentary Fund and serves on the leadership council of Hispanics and philanthropy. Please join me in welcoming our host and moderator tonight, Gary LaMarche. And I am handing it over to you, my friend. Well, thank you very much. It's good to be here. There's been such enormous enthusiasm in the room. I've never been in a dinner where people were more enthusiastic about what was going on. So who's up for a stimulating panel discussion now <laughs> while you have dessert? OK. I assume that the people who aren't up for a stimulating panel discussion have voted with their feet, and the rest of you are going to be so, so focused on actually hearing a little bit more about what some of the tremendous activists that the North Star Foundation funds are doing. So they, they asked me to do this. They said it was, they wanted me to be Oprah. Uh, you know, I don't aspire to be <laughs> Oprah. There is no, uh, no automobiles being given out in case anybody's staying for that reason. There won't be any free cars. When I was a kid, I grew up watching talk shows, you know, Johnny Carson and so on. I thought I might grow up and interview Buddy Hackett and Caro and, you know, uh, uh, Steve Lawrence and Edie Gourmet. I'm dating myself. Someone will come and rip off my I'm, I'm the future of activism button, you know, for having that. And here I find myself the host of a talk show with uh, actually a better fantasy than I could ever have imagined. Three people who are part of organizations that are really working from the ground up to change New York. So what I have here, I'm supposed to introduce them in a certain order, and I hope I got that right because there's supposed to be some <laughs> slides. But anyway, if the wrong picture shows up, you'll let me know. John Blanco, who's the lead organizer of Fierce. Um, <laughs> I guess I should say a little bit about him. Uh, he joined the Fierce staff in January 2009 as an organizer after a year of being an active member. Uh, he graduated from high school in New York City in 2008, where he helped to coordinate the school's Gay-Straight Alliance. He's also been active in AIDS and HIV AIDS peer education and prevention outreach since he was 17 years old and lived in the Lower East Side. So welcome, John Blanco. Um, giving up the battle and putting on my glasses. Anna Maria Archila emigrated to the United States from her native Colombia at the age of 17. There's a theme emerging here tonight. 17-year-old activism, promise, and so on. And has since emerged as a great advocate for civil rights, health care access, education reform, and immigrant rights in New York City. She was awarded a Coro Fellowship in 2004, and in the same year became executive director of the Latin American Integration Center. Under her leadership, they strengthened services to immigrants in Queens and Staten Island. In 2007, when uh, the Latin American Integration Center merged with Make the Road by walking to become Make the Road New York, Ana Maria became co-executive director and now oversees the organization's Voter Power Project and Make the Road New York statewide expansion, beginning with Long Island. This is a place where I would like, if we hadn't been running a little late, tell the story of how uh, we made the first significant grant when I was at OSI to Make the Road after I found the co-founders in a church uh, basement, or attic maybe it was. But, so that's a very proud moment for me. Uh, so welcome, Ana Maria. And Finally, I want to introduce uh, Wanda Hernandez, who's a leader and board member for Vocal New York, formerly... Yeah. Uh, <laughs> I now realize why we're running a little over, because enthusiasm actually takes, takes time, you know? Uh, she's been HIV positive for more than 15 years. She was born in Puerto Rico and raised in El Barrio. She now lives in the Bronx. Let's hear it for El Barrio. 
is, a, is an outspoken advocate for social justice in New York. And during the past couple of years alone, she's represented vocal in a White House meeting on HIV AIDS, a city council and state legislative hearings, major actions calling for Wall Street accountability, and helped lead a campaign to win a rent cap protection for homeless New Yorkers living with age. She got a BA in business management and worked in various business administrative positions during her career. Welcome very much, uh, Wanda. Thank you. Now, um, I don't know if we'll get to this because you know we're running a little over, but we do. We are taking Twitter questions. Anybody who wants to do it on Twitter, uh, anybody who would rather do it with pen and paper, there are uh, cards running around. We may have time to answer to get a few questions from those of you in the audience. The way I want to do this is I'm going to ta ask a question to each of the panelists. Uh, and they're going to talk for just a couple of minutes about a particular question for them. Then we're going to have a couple of questions that are a group discussion, all very short. And then if we have time, we'll open it up and I'll make some closing remarks that you will not want to miss. Uh, so um, I wanted to start uh, first with John and talk about, it's really, I mean, I'm really moved and impressed by the, um, by, by, both, by the achievements of all the groups here tonight and by the genuine authenticity of people fighting and taking the lead for change in their own behalf. Um, uh, you know, Fierce has a tremendous way of engaging young leaders. You've had your own transition in a relatively short period of time to a leadership position in an organization that creates and cultivates a lot of leaders. Can you just talk a little bit about your own odyssey? Yeah. Well, as you were saying before, so I started in Fierce in 2007, and at that time, I had no idea about what was going on in the world or like, wasn't aware of the issues um, and just of the social justice movement and all of the amazing organizations that are here today um, and just out there. Um, and getting involved in Fierce just opened my eyes to what is going on in the world and just opening my eyes to the amount of police harassment that, you know, myself as someone who identifies as queer, but also a person of color and also a youth, um, encountering many different forms of harassment or oppression. Um, and just knowing that this is something that many communities face every single day, every single hour, every single minute. Um, and being more aware, learning of my history, learning of what I can do, um, and just realizing that we all have a voice. You see, make the road vocal, fierce here, all with our voices, and all of you have voices too. Many different communities here, all coming together. So when I came into Fierce and was able to connect with other people who, at one point in time, I thought, hey, maybe it's only me, but it's not only me. There's many people out there facing the same things that I'm facing every single day. Making that connection and just building that strong relationship, I feel was able to help me in my transformation and my leadership as a member, as an organizer, and now currently as the lead organizer of Fierce. Well, John, thank you. I want to take it with Ana Maria uh, to, uh, from your uh, uh, widening your own horizons through the work with Fierce, to, to North Star's role. So you're on the uh, grants committee of, uh, a community grants committee of North Star. A little less about Make the Road than I was interested in having you say a little bit, for people here particularly who, who are relatively new to North Star, about the impact that North Star has in the way it goes about its funding and the impact it has in the organizations it funds. From your perspective, not just as a recipient organization, but somebody who's actually in the process that's, that's led, as I understand it, by community organizations. Yes. So North Star is actually a very special place because a lot of the values that we talked about today, the value of promoting democracy, of promoting leadership, of nurturing um, spaces for people to participate are actually expressed in the way that North Star does its grant giving. So as a foundation, North Star has chosen to put the people who are directly doing the work, uh, people like the three of us and many of you in the audience, give us the opportunity to actually participate in thinking about how to, um, how to uh, direct resources to people in our community. So North Star has the community funding board. I've participated in the community funding board. Other folks here have too. And our work is actually to, to um, try to understand the landscape of what's happening in the city and figure out how uh, using our own experience assessing and, and actually celebrating the work that's happening across the city of New York, 
Um, it's a very, very, I think it's a very special um, way of doing the work that actually brings the kind of the intelligence and the, and the expertise of people on the ground um, and in a way that has transformed the city. When we look at who's in the audience and the end vocal and fears and make the road, um, you know, the, our organizations, some of the first grants that we received were actually from Nordstar. And when we see the landscape of how organizing has changed in New York City and how organizing has changed New York City, um, I think a lot of that comes from the kind of uh, values that drive the, the giving that Nordstar has done um, that has, you know, really expressed kind of the, the, the values of, of promoting leadership and promoting democracy by doing, uh, by doing its grant giving from, from the perspective of, of grantees. Well, I want to get back in a minute to how the landscape has changed in recent years, but I, what I hear you saying is that the North Star and the way it goes about its work kind of walks the walk you know, with the communities that it funds and maybe even makes the road by walking it. I don't That's know. That's right. Because um, <laughs> a great turn of phrase. Um, so Wanda, I want to kind of take it home in terms of the initial questions with you by broadening the lens a little bit more again to the times that we are in. So you've been very active as an advocate, you know, uh, in vocal uh, on a variety of kind of city and state issues. I mean, the state budget situation is dire, the city budget situation is so good. You know, what are the particular challenges of this time and this moment that we're living in for the work that you guys are doing? Um, today, this 2011, we find that the challenge is still um, a long winding road. Um, of course, we have to, um, be able to, as Boku does, um, build power among um, low-income individuals living with the virus, not just um, with those individuals uh, living with the virus, but just to be able to make just communities as a whole is very important for us, which is why we went out of our silo um, and just concentrating on just the HIV AIDS work. Um, we also address other core issues which affect not, you know, once again ourselves, but everyone as a whole, as a community and as a country to work together and be able to um, make things better for change. So um, let me ask those of you who are uh, uh, having side conversations to take them someplace else because, you know, we really want to be respectful of the testimony and the work that people are doing up here. Um, <laughs> So um, this frames a couple of questions that I wanted to ask all of you. Uh, and, and a minute ago, you were talking about the change in, in the landscape, and Maria was in the last 10 years. So what I'm struck by in learning, I, mean, I knew a lot about Make the Road. I knew somewhat less about Fierce and Vocal until recently, but I've studied up in them. And you're all really tremendously inspiring. But one of the things you're struck by, uh, particularly those of us who are more old timers in the audience, is how relatively new. You know, that, so if you turn the landscape back you know, 10 or 15 years, you know, you wouldn't find a lot of what's going on. Mm -hmm. So how would each of you say, you know, that the picture has changed? You were making an argument, Ana Maria, that I, that I think is really important for people to understand about the way, you know, growing activism that's led by communities most affected is changing policy in New York. And all of you have great examples of that. So you talk a little bit about how that landscape is changing and how it may need to change further. Let's start with you. So, um, yeah, so when we started about 13 years ago, we were living in the Giuliani years. Um, it was the mid-90s, welfare reform, some of the most uh, regressive and, and, and really dehumanizing immigration laws were being put in place. Um, and, and in New York City, uh, really a lot of the organizations that today uh, can claim the victories, the policy victories that have changed the lives of working people, um, a lot of those organizations were really very small. When we started, we started out of the basement of a church in Bushwick, um, a group of women, immigrant women, who were losing uh, their ability to feed their families and, and keep a roof over their heads, um, were meeting to talk about how to first feed their families and then um, quickly started to, to think about what were the barriers that immigrant women and immigrant communities were facing and, and just having basic access to, to housing, work, um, education. And, and from those conversations grew an organization that, that developed into an institution that's actually pretty well respected and taken seriously by elected officials and by other power brokers in the city. I think that transformation really has been possible because uh, first there was 
in the 90s and up to uh, what we see as a kind of more mature um, process is a lot of emphasis on actually building the leadership of people and that are directly impacted by the policies that are that um, that we have in the books and so that that emphasis I think really um, has has ha we've, we're starting to see now 10 15 years later um, the fruits of that labor um, the fact that we were able to pass the wage theft prevention act is not is not a coincidence it took us we, we spent the last 10 years helping immigrant workers and other workers who were not getting paid minimum wage, who were not getting paid overtime, who sometimes were not getting paid at all. We spent the last 10 years fighting those cases, learning the law, le learning the pitfalls of the law, which made us experts in being able to actually change the law and the, and the fact that we spent the last 13 years building relationships with, with over 8,000 people made us powerful enough to be taken seriously in Albany. And so that transformation, um, that, that, that emphasis on base building, um, and that emphasis on focusing on the experiences, the real life experiences of people in neighborhoods, people who've been excluded from, from the tables where decisions are made, um, is now is now showing the fruits, and I think the same is true for fears. The same is true no, for vocal. It's absolutely and for other clear. When you look at it. So take take fears for a minute. So you guys uh, are are involved in all kinds of panels on the west side and what's going on in the village. Uh, I'm sure that wasn't done out of uh, politeness by the authorities. It was done because you <laughs> claimed and demanded a seat at the table. You got the seat at the table now. How do you see that playing out in terms of what what's going to happen with that? Where you know we see with the wage step thing took a long time to do. Right? It doesn't happen overnight. Now you're kind of in the room, you know, or the voices you represent are in the room. Where do you go from there? Yeah, I think for us, it's just, it's pushing to make sure that this is not the only opportunity right. where that happens. Mm -hmm. That it shouldn't be, it shouldn't take this long time to make that change in our communities. This should be something that should be happening already. Um, our communities, the people that are directly affected by the issues, should always be at the forefront of what we are discussing and what we are talking about. Um, and just taking the, <laughs> taking the West Village, for example, as Anna Maria was talking, the same went for Fierce, and it took Fierce time to get free programming on the pier mm -hmm. for LGBTQ youth. But when, it, when that did happen, in 2009, we were able to have the first two ever free events. And then last year, we were able to have eight events. Um, and then this year, we have secured six more events happening on the pier. Um, so for us, it's around making sure that, you know, some of the folks, for example, in Fierce's work in the context of Fierce, some of the LGBTQ youth um, who go down to the West Village might not own property in the West Village, but this is their safe space. If we go historically back to Stone, the Stonewall riots um, and just talking about those days that Historically, this is their safe space. This is where youth go. And just for me personally, when I was 16, which is when I came out the closet, where did I go? I went to the West Village um, because it was my safe space. And even though we don't own like property there, we're coming into the neighborhood, we're still community. And the community should have a say in what's going on. Um, but it takes time. Yeah. But organizing is really important. And not just organizing within your own community, but connecting with, me connecting with many different communities, talking about the intersections, talking about what are the different identities that we all have, because we don't have one identity. We have many different identity. Mm -hmm. And just the work that Vocal's doing, the, the work that Make the Road's doing, overlaps with the work that Fierce is doing. Um, and just understanding that and identifying that is really key to this movement. Absolutely. I'm really struck by the way all of your uh, group's names who are so powerful all <laughs> say something about what you are and what you do, right? Make the road, vocal, fierce. Um, so I want to ask one more question to you, Wanda, and then maybe others can chime in if they want, and then I'll see uh, whoever's running me here will tell me whether we had a little, have a little time for questions from the audience. Um, what would you want uh, funders to understand uh, about thinking about supporting a group like Vocal? Uh, because there is, uh, one of the reasons we hold events like this is to connect people who can provide the support more to the work. And what, what, what do they need to understand better? A lot's been accomplished tonight, but if you had to say one or two things that you'd love people to get about it. 
um, as our two allies have been saying um, you know, all along during the panel, um, you'd be surprised at how much um, all of our allies' um, work kind of intermingles, uh, whether it's through the HIV issues, whether it's, whether it's through the homelessness issues, whether it's through incarceration. The truth is that we have to work together um, because we are power in numbers and everyone's voice um, counts. And it is very important for people to remember the epidemic, the HIV AIDS epidemic is not gonna go away unless we all work together to, to ensure um, healthy and just communities and not just in that, but to stop that vicious cycle that continues to be vulnerable uh, for our folks, which is bringing them back to the table. If you expose them to homelessness, obviously that's gonna expose others to, to the, to the um, epidemic, or it's gonna cause them to not take their medication, which makes other people, you know, at risk of being infected. So it's very important that um, all communities and all allies and individuals work together. Go on, Ed. In terms of any lessons you want to leave uh, the people in this room, particularly those who are less familiar with North Star and less familiar with groups like yours, Anna Maria? Um, I think there are, we were, today we were talking a lot about uh, Frederick Douglass, obviously because he inspires the, the name of the organization. I think many, many kind of important leaders that have transformed our country and that have come pushed us forward into, into a, a space of more dignity have highlighted the fact that our lives are interdependent, that when someone in Bushwick is not getting paid for the work that she's doing, Mm -hmm. um, that's ro not only robbing her of her dignity and her ability to feed her family, it's robbing all of us of the ability to say, we love the place where we live, we feel proud of the place where we live, we feel like we are part of, uh, of something that, that, that expresses our aspirations. And so I feel like to the extent that we can contribute, we can use North Star as a place to, to express our desire and our intention to transform society in the direction that we want to see it, which is a direction where everyone has opportunity, everyone has dignity, everyone has the basic ability to live um, and to achieve their potential. And that's what North Star um, can do for us, create that opportunity for us to be part of that process together. I think, well, I think for, as we were saying earlier, when Fierce folks came up here, there was, a, there was the quote that Azrael, who's an active member of Fierce, had said, and it was by Asada Shakur, who was a member of the Black Panther Party. Um, and just, just taking that quote and just listening to it, it is our duty to fight. It is our duty to win, and it is our duty to love each other, protect each other, and we have nothing to lose but our chains. Just taking that quote, I think that that quote says it all right there. Um, tells you all, like, what's the reason that we're organizing? Because one, our communities are being directly affected, but we also know that if our community, if this is gonna happen to our community, then it's gonna happen to another community. It's gonna happen to another one. It's gonna be an impact across all communities. That's the reason why we all should be working together in this movement, if we want to have a movement. Yes. Mm -hmm. Well, you know, thank you. The, um, to the wealthy people in the room, I want to say you have nothing to lose but some of your net worth. Um, but, um, but it's my job to kind of wrap it up here, and I want to say a few things to wrap it up. One of the things I'm really struck, uh, both by the uh, amazing uh, work that the North Star grantees are doing, but also by the solidarity and collegiality, you know, that they experience, that they exhibit among themselves. You know, one of the things we see in the funding world is too often there's competition, too often there's a sense it's a zero-sum situation. That's not the way any of these grantees look at it. It's something in the ethos of North Star and the way that it operates that caused people to think of themselves as part of an interdependent whole and not as atomized groups that are competing with one another for resources. You know, this week I get, I'm the head of a big foundation. I'm sitting here as the kind of in the white man of privilege role. Uh, you know, I get to, I'm having a conversation tomorrow with another white, two, many other white men of privilege. Uh, some of you are coming, doing a conversation with Jeff Rakes, who heads Gates, and then with George Soros and R.A. Nair from Open Society. But this actually is the high point of my week, I can tell you very much. Because the privilege that I've had over the years is to be able uh, to, 
be in a position to steer some of the resources of wealthy people uh, to people who are at the front lines of change and need support. And that is the privilege that everybody in this room, to one degree or another, can participate in. Um, you know, the thing about North Star that's been said here that I want is somebody in this business, in this line of work, who's learned a lot from North Star, want to stress to all of you, is that there's enormous power in having activists as leaders and as funders, and having those decisions informed by the community, not in any kind of top-down way. That is very, very rare, and when you find the opportunity to do it and it works well, you need to do more of it. Uh, you know, a lot of people talk about organizing and they have some skepticism about, you know, what are the tangible, they don't quite get A to B to C. You know, they understand if you put money into building a hospital, it rises up and it helps people, you know, uh, take care of people and so on. They get some of those things. It's always hard for people to get organizing, but it couldn't be more crystal clear, listening to all the stories of the groups tonight, that real, real tangible change comes when you uh, put people who most need the change in the forefront of the change. We're talking about a wage, left, wage theft law in New York state that make real difference in the lives of actual people is making real difference. We're talking about being at the table and planning decisions that where they weren't before. You're talking about access to syringes or changing the way you know, votes are counted and prison gerrymandering. Those are all enormous and real achievements that could not have happened if they hadn't been put on the agenda you know, by groups uh, that live that every single day. So we've seen really powerful actions of how money, you know, the money that you folks here tonight have contributed to make this the most successful dinner North Star has ever had. This is my timer telling me they were out of time, okay. Um, and that's pretty good timing, actually, because I'm almost done. Um, so, you know, big philanthropy, such as is represented by Atlantic or Ford or OSI, will come and go and never be a permanently secure ally. I can tell you as somebody who you know, has tried to ally the foundations I've been associated with with these things. Uh, over time, the sustainability of this kind of work is only going to come from a strong mass base. You know, one of the things these groups have in common is they actually represent people. They represent 7,000, 8,000 people whose stories actually inform the work. It's not some think tank figuring out what a wage theft policy ought to look like. It's people deciding on the basis of their lived experience and what they're dealing with every day who decide that change needs to happen and how to get it and take the responsibility to get it. So it's a privilege to, to, to have over the years been able to learn from folks like this. It's a privilege to be able to sit here tonight and help tell, get their stories out to all of you. And it will be a privilege for all of you to step up the pace in terms of your support for organizations like North Star that play a really pivotal role in sustaining the activism and the change that's coming from people who are taking the reins of their own lives. So thank you, John, Wanda, Ana Maria. Chris wants to know Lady Gaga or Ma this is a question for me. <laughs> and I just had a stirring finish. Everybody's whipping out their checkbooks and like I'm so say for Gara, Lady oh. Gaga or Madonna and why? <laughs> oh. <laughs> uh, Lady Gaga, but I don't know that I can articulate you know a very strategic reason for it. So in my funding life, I have to justify the strategic decisions. In my musical life, I don't have to. <laughs> Good night. Thank you. Thank you. So to you stalwarts, thank you. We are almost at the end of our program. Liz has some closing words for you. The only reason I'm back up here is because someone met the challenge that I posed in my speech at the beginning of the night. Ladies and gentlemen, an anonymous donor in honor of the three people who were honored tonight, Vinny, Lawrence and Arva and the three amazing groups has anonymously doted, donated $18,000 to help us get to $600,000. So if you hold tight, Liz Winstead has a closing thought. Thank you all so much for coming and sticking around. Thank you, everybody, tonight. I quickly, Vinny and Lawrence and Arva, if I could get you up to the stage real quick for a photo. And I just wanted to say, um, it's really fun in, in this time that seems incredibly, insurmountably awful um, with the way that government funding is, is cutting everything and community activism. It's amazing to be in a room with 500 people who give a shit. I'm glad I could be part of it. Thank you for having me. 
Thank you for putting your money where your mouth is and your mouth where your boots are and your boots on the ground. Thank you so much. You people are amazing. Um, and thank you, North Star Fund, for uh, just being wonderful. Now, don't go away because there's dancing. Is that what you wanted me to tell the people, that there's dancing?